Welcome to our online discussion entitled Dismantling Democracy, part of the 2019-2020 Kupferberg Holocaust Center and National Endowment for the Humanities Colloquium, Authoritarian, Authoritarian on the Continuum, Complicity, Opposition, and Dissent. My name is Dr. Laura Cohen, Executive Director of the Harriet and Kenneth Kupferberg Holocaust Center, located at Queensborough Community College in New York City. Our mission is to use the lessons of the Holocaust to educate current and future generations about the ramifications of prejudice, racism, and stereotyping. In doing so, we teach and empower citizens to become agents of positive social change in their lives and communities. You can find more information about our programming and exhibitions at khc.qcc.cuny.edu. This year's colloquium explores current manifest manifestations of authoritarianism and public responses voicing both complicity and dissent. It includes a year-long program of events drawing upon the community of scholars at QCC whose work addresses themes pertaining to the ideological, political, psychological, and aesthetic conditions that undergird authoritarianism. The series was made possible through the generous support of the National Endowment for the Humanities, as well as the New York City Council. We're honored to welcome our two speakers, Dr. Jessica Pisano and Dr. Kevin Anderson, for what promises to be a thought-provoking dialogue. The colloquium is organized by Dr. Julia Rothenberg, the KHC's current scholar in residence. Dr. Rothenberg is Associate Professor of Sociology in Queensborough's Social Sciences Department. Her pedagogy and publications focus on overlapping topics within urban sociology and the sociology of art, race, and ethnicity, as well as social and cultural theory. And now I'll turn it over to Dr. Rothenberg. Thank you all for participating in our final event. Uh, of the series, I'm gonna first introduce our. I'm gonna introduce our first speaker, um, Dr. Kevin Anderson, who is a professor of sociology at University of California, Santa Barbara. He's the author of Lenin, Hegel, and Western Marxism: A Critical Study, uh, Foucault and the Iranian Revolution, Gender and the Seductions of Islamism. That's all one title. Um, 2005, University of Chicago Press, and Marx at the Margins on Nationalism, Ethnicity, and Non-Western Societies, also University of Chicago Press, 2016. And he's the co-editor of the Rosen Luxemburg Reader um, and Karl Marx, uh, and also the Dunievskaya Marcuse from Correspondence. Uh, currently, he's working on a study of Marx's late writings on non-Western and pre-capitalist societies and gender. He teaches graduate seminars in classical social theory, contemporary social theory, and Marx and Marxism. Uh, I'd like to welcome Dr. Kevin Anderson. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's, uh, it's good to be back in New York, even though just virtually uh, it's sort of my hometown. Grew up in northern New Jersey. And uh, I want to start by just thanking the people of New York. I mean, we've been talking all over the media about the suffering of the people of New York in the pandemic, but the, the discipline and uh, sacrifice really that the citizens of and residents of the New York area made has really, uh, you know, I think it's prevented the pandemic from being even worse than it would have been for the entire country. So I wanted to start with that. My, my talk is, is entitled simply, What is Authoritarian Politics? It's an attempt to give an overview. I'm sure that a lot of it will be very familiar to number of people in the audience, but some of it won't be, particularly the part on imperialism and colonialism at the end. So let's, uh, let's just get started. But this is a fairly basic overview, and we can discuss specific issues more uh, later on if people want to. Let me see here. Okay. Um, so first of all, what is democracy in the normal liberal democracy sense of we, we, I gave a list of 47 things, but majority rule, uh, open debate, uh, in order to, you know, open debate between parties and movements and interest groups. And then even after the election, it's not majoritarianism. There's a right to dissent against the government and even against the majority. And there's rights for minorities. Now, liberal democracy has been around in various forms for about 150 years. There's been lots and lots of debate over its limitations, especially like in the social sphere. I mean, 
if you're homeless and living on the street, to what extent can you exercise these these rights? Uh, so people talk about radical democracy. It, it's it's often talked about in terms of the, the, the social and economic sphere, but I want to mention in a different way radical democracy, uh, which you see in some forms of socialism, also would mean extending what we call democracy to new spheres where it's absent. Of course, the really obvious one would be the workplace. Another one might be the military. Do you elect your officers? Do you elect your boss? Uh, so that takes me right into authoritarianism, because once we get outside this fairly narrow political sphere where we have elections and political parties and voting rights and rights of freedom of speech, a lot of our lives are, 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 exist in spaces that are actually authoritarian. So we don't have to go to Nazi Germany or Stalin's Russia to feel that. We, we can just feel it in minor ways right in our daily experience. So. I just want to give an example because when I was at CUNY, CUNY is in Harvard, so not all the grad students are fully funded with lucrative uh, fellowships and so forth. So one thing I did while I was at CUNY was I drove a taxi part-time. This was before the owner driver days. So we, we actually came in and there were never enough cabs. There were always more work. So we'd be like waiting around to get a cab and then to get out in the street and start making some money. So there was an Management was very authoritarian, but there was a new guy one day, and he'd been waiting about an hour. So he walked up to this uh, to this counter where the boss was behind, like a bulletproof uh, shield type thing, and uh, he said, "I have a question. Like, do you know how much longer it'll be to get me a cab so I can go out and go to work?" So the boss didn't say anything; just started writing something on a piece of paper, and then he stopped and he said, "You see what this is?" This is your dismissal slip. So if you have any more questions, what I'm going to do is sign that, and then you'll be fired. So I suggest you go sit down and shut up. That's authoritarianism. Uh, and in a certain sense, uh, what authoritarianism means is taking these kinds of things, harsh parental power over minor children when it's exercised in a harsh fashion, the military command structure, prison administration, taking these kinds of things that exist all around it, extending it further, extending back into, the, into that sphere that is democratic, and then democracy gets wiped out um, and you have authoritarianism. So in this sense, even though, I mean, some people in the audience probably have lived under authoritarian regimes, uh, but we all know what it is from our daily experience. And another thing I could have listed is uh, policing of communities of color is often, you don't have the right of freedom of speech when a cop is stopping someone. And to ask, oh, officer, I have a question. Like, why are you stopping that? You're gonna end up in handcuffs uh, pretty quickly in a lot of those kinds of situations. Okay, so as I was saying, when this is ex extended back, uh, this is when we, um, this is how we can think about it. But I want to go talk about the three most extreme versions of authoritarianism, total versions, sometimes called totalitarianism, fascism, Stalinism, and imperialism. I'm going to spend most of the time on fascism, which has been talked about a lot lately uh, with the rise of movements that seem to have some echoes of fascism and even uh, governments uh, in some parts of the world. So the key examples are, of course, Nazi Germany under Hitler, Italian fascism under Mussolini. And again, I could have a much longer list, but here's some of the, here's some of the kinds of appeals or kinds of principles, if you could call them that, that these kind of regimes have. Okay, extreme nationalism. Uh, there was a joke during the time of Nazism, there was this thing, Germans should buy German lemons. Well, lemon trees don't grow in Germany. Uh, so extreme, there was an Italian film about the Holocaust where this woman said, uh, pom-poms, and, and someone said, no, no, you have to make that Italian. It should be like pompano. We can't say pom-poms. That's a French word. Uh, support of so-called traditional family values, uh, kinder, kirche, and kuche, uh, Ch children, child, uh, family, and church. That was a slogan of Nazis, and where women 
the, the, was where women were supposed to uh, occupy themselves. Extreme hostility toward modern feminism uh, of all variants, yet at the same time, it's, it's ambivalent because they have the Hitler youth and the Hitler women's core, and they go around and do things. They go on camping trips and they boss around people. So it's, it's not entirely traditional, but they talk of it in terms of traditional. Uh, hatred, stoking hatred of racial and religious minorities, which already exists in most of these societies, but it takes a political movement to stoke it, to multiply it. I mean, I don't think the United States thought of itself uh, 10 years ago as a particularly anti-immigrant country compared to, say, Germany or France or Britain. And yet I think we've seen that kind of sentiment stoked uh, in the last uh, few years. This is something that's often forgotten in the U.S. discussions, anti-socialist, anti-communist, anti-trade union, because when Hitler came to power, I mean, of course, they, as we know, they immediately targeted the Jews, but the Jews were on an organized group. The trade unions, the Communist Party, the Socialist Party, these were organized groups that were opposed to fascism. They had to be crushed immediately, or they could have possibly organized a opposition, which to an extent they tried to do, but they were just uh, overwhelmed uh, by this, the, uh, the, the brutality of, of the repression, which they had not expected. Uh, old conservative forces are always there. Now, now, fascism is not the same thing as right-wing conservatism, but it operates in, a, in the same sphere. So in Germany, for instance, about half the population and certainly half of the political forces or more uh, opposed having a republic at all, had nostalgia for the old monarchy. Those forces allied with or allowed the fascists uh, to come to power. In fact, Hitler was appointed a prime minister by one of those old, uh, old conservatives, uh, General Hindenburg. And then big things always about law and order and uh, cracking down on crime, uh, Always a, a big thing, and the notion of society. So these are the kinds of appeals that uh, fascist uh, and Nazi movements make. Now, when they get into power, or even beforehand, one of the characteristics is a use of paramilitary organizations. The police and the regular military are, if you will, not conservative enough for them. They have to augment that. Uh, and especially at the beginning in Germany, there were huge hundreds of thousands of these paramilitary uh, SA forces. Suppression of democracy and dissent very early on, not only through law, but through uh, street action, mob violence, targeting ga gangster-like fashion, going to people's homes, beating them up, threatening them, killing them, so forth. A warlike stance toward other countries, uh, getting into all even small disputes over territories, uh, building up the military, constantly talking about war and whipping up because patriotism and war is often a, a way of a, of a system or regime getting support at least initially. And don't forget, Hitler, Hitler didn't campaign on a program that we're going to launch a war that kills 40 million Europeans and you know 10 million Germans. I mean, it, it was like, we're going to be tough and these other countries will will back down. Uh, state control over much of the economy. Uh, the, the private business interests that to some extent support them coming in get quite upset later when they realize that actually the Nazis are, are going to control it. Uh, the head of the Tyson Steel Corporation gave a lot of money to Hitler. He made uh, some statements criticizing and boy, he was like out of there very, very fast. Uh, women's and youth associations, and I mentioned this before, while they, and also worker associations, while uh, they ban and uh, suppress the feminist organizations, the uh, democratic youth associations, and uh, the socialist, communist, and trade uh, parties and trade unions, they set up their own alternatives. So there's a fascist women's association that mobilizes women. There's the Hitler Youth, which is extremely important, uh, modeled partly on some things like the Boy Scouts. Uh, and there's a pervasive and harsh secret police and very early on concentration camps are set up for political prisoners, for, for Jews and other ethnic minorities that are being persecuted. 
but it takes a while to actually, and a lot of people die in those, they're very brutal, but then the campaign of outright genocide uh, against uh, Jews and lesser known against uh, Roma or gypsies and uh, LGBT people. Uh, so that's, a, that's an overview of, of a Nazi form of uh, authoritarian. The other two I'm gonna be uh, much briefer on. Second variant, which actually in some ways is, came beforehand because it kind of consolidates by the late 1920s at the latest, depending on how you interpret it, is Stalinist communism. Now this is less talked about today uh, since the collapse of the Soviet Union and this Eastern European satellite nations, but the system was in power from roughly 1929 to 91 in Russia, persists today in North Korea and in many respects in China, although with a lot of changes uh, over the past uh, 20 years, certainly in terms of economic relation. This system is different in the sense that its ideology is less militaristic, there's a lot of talk of equality, community, full democracy, et cetera. But the practice is usually the opposite with, a, as in fascism, a single party state, secret police, forced labor camps, not out, outright death camps, but you know, tens of millions of people die in these camps in the Soviet Union, even more than that in uh, China. Now it was able to survive longer than fascism and to modernize some countries successfully, uh, especially China, and for a while, uh, Russia, it had some success there too. Uh, this is an example of how th th its talk is false. I wanna give a thing about community because the whole term communism refers to community and collectivity and solidarity, but with a secret police system and as in fascism, the system of people denouncing each other, what happens is that even in private conversations, people are extremely reticent about expressing anything. I mean, think about living in North Korea today, even like cracking a joke about Trump's buddy uh, uh, over there. And uh, so th th there's a joke, which is, well, it's not really a joke, but our two guys are in a bar, they get really drunk, and one makes a joke against uh, Stalin and the other one like adds onto it. The one wakes up in the morning, says, oh God, if I don't get in there and turn that guy in, he's gonna turn me in. But the other guy had gotten there first. They had each gone in to turn uh, each other in. So that's certainly not community or solidarity. It's, it's a more extreme atomization than even the most extreme forms of uh, normal, uh, you know, modern capitalist society. Okay, the last one I wanna talk about is imperialism and colonialism. It has now there's many forms of imperialism that existed back to the Romans and the Egyptians and the ancient Chinese and so forth. But I'm talking about modern imperialism of the beginning around the 1870s. It's fairly overtly racialized in that by that time, uh, there's a lot of racialized theories about the cultural and even biological inferiority of uh, people of color going around. Uh, even in this country, we had the uh, restrictions on immigration around 1920 that were based on this, this racialized and ethnicized uh, view. Uh, this form of imperialism is mainly in Africa and Asia and then in a slightly indirect form in Latin America. Doesn't really end till the 1980s uh, when the last countries like Zimbabwe and a few others gain uh, their independence. Now, Sometimes the methods are relatively benign, say British rule in India in the 20th century, but not as benign as you think. Like when, when Mahatma Gandhi was put in jail in the early 1930s, he was allowed one visitor a month and just a couple reading, you know, a couple books. He, could, he didn't have access to different books that uh, he wanted. His letters were censored. He was not allowed to discuss anything political. So this is a very harsh system, even under the British. Now, what really got harsh was Congo in Central Africa, where it took on genocidal proportion. The population actually went down. Uh, there, was, there was starvation was used as a method of social control and lots of physical uh, brutality toward the uh, indigenous population. And of course, even in its more benign forms, it's never dem democratic. It's always ruled by a colonial administration from another country that could ban political parties, the Senate, et cetera. 
there's always economic exploitation to, to enrich the ruling country. And the biggest imperialist powers were Britain and France. And some have written, like the, the great our, our writer on our African our liberation, M.A. Césaire, uh, wrote uh, that a lot of what the Nazis did was anticipated by colonial practices. And Hermann Goering, who was considered the second most important person in Nazi Germany, uh, his, uh, one of his uh, relatives had been involved in genocidal suppression uh, as a German military officer in Africa in the early 20th century. And I also want to mention that there's a lot of discussion about how the African regimes have become uh, authoritarian after independence. But what is their model? What the people who led those regimes grew up under this dictatorial colonial re re regime. So that was the, I mean, there may, might have been talk in the schools about it for those that were, got, were able to have an advanced education about democracy. But in terms of actual practices, it was a single party authoritarian uh, state that they uh, lived under. And also the racial ideologies of colonialism that, that propped it up and also grew alongside it. These fuel definitely uh, fascism. Uh, these are a big fuel for fact. Hannah Arendt uh, writes quite a bit about that in her book, Origins of Totalitarianism. So what leads to such developments? Well, often there's a deep social disruption like a depression or a war. Certainly a Soviet Russia was in deep, deep difficulty uh, by the late 1920s. The economy was in, in a shambles. They had been in war, they were in, and had been in war, a civil war for about eight years in the, until about 1921. The hope for revolutions in other countries uh, to get them out from under the sanctions and other kinds of things uh, had, law, had seemed to lose hope. Uh, Nazi Germany, I mean, Hitler, Hitler's party was, you know, getting well under 10% of the vote until the Great Depression hit. Uh, and even with imperialism and colonialism, one could argue that it's a product of the stagnation of industrial capitalism and an attempt to uh, forestall that by going abroad for cheaper labor, cheaper raw materials, uh, and so forth. So authoritarianism is often stoked by a sense that the economy and the standard of living is stagnating or worse, and a sense that something drastic has to be done to save society. I think of this metaphor that some of the far, far right had about electing Trump, which is that the train is running, we've just got to like pull the brake, we've got to stop it or we're going to go over the, the cliff. Uh, but a very important factor is the presence of organized groups and ideologies to justify it, to frame it, to organize it. Because I was saying before, there's lots of latent racism and anti-immigrant sentiment probably in all societies. But it helps a lot if you have organized groups that can put forth ideologies and have institutional power to, uh, to do that. Uh, and then it has to have some kind of mass base of support. There's a lot of discussion of what that was. Let's take fascism for, in Germany. I mean, a lot of the mass base of support was tended to be in the rural areas. And there's huge debate about this, but certainly people like Eric Fromm, and Leon Trotsky, key analysts of fascism in the early days, they pointed to the lower middle class as a mass base of support. We've taught the United States about uh, rural areas and, uh, and uh, the so-called uh, poor whites or white working class as uh, bases of support. So there has to be some kind of base of support uh, for these things in the Soviet Union, possibly the new bureaucratic class that had gotten jobs as a result of the revolution. In uh, colonialism, you have all these people who don't have jobs in the mother country or don't have as good ones as they'd like to. They can go abroad and become big shots and make a lot of money and, and, and have a lot of status and prestige. So I'm, I'm going to end there and uh, just ask the question, what features of these uh, various aspects I've talked about can we see around us today? Thank you very much. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Anderson. You've given us a, a lot to digest and discuss, um, some 
some news not as happy as maybe we would like. Um, I'd like to now introduce our second speaker, Dr. Jessica Pisano. She is an associate professor in the politics department at the New School for Social Research. She's on leave uh, at, in 2019-2020 um, as a visiting scholar at the Jordan Center for the Advanced Study of Russia at NYU. Um, she's an associate of the Davis Center for Russian and Eurasian Studies at Harvard University and has been an invited professor at the Ecole des Hautes Etudes uh, in Paris. Um, Pisano writes about contemporary and 20th century politics and property rights in Eastern Europe, where she's interested in how economic change affects people's lives and how those effects translate into changes in local, national, and global politics. She has recently completed a book about the political economy of command performances of democratic institutions in Russia and Ukraine and is writing a 20th century history of a single rural street in Eastern Europe. Um, her book, The Post-Soviet Potemkin Village, Politics and Property Rights in the Black Earth, published by Cambridge University Press in 2008, won the Davis Center Book Prize in Political and Social Studies. Um, she's also written a series of articles on impeachment and Ukrainian and political politics for the online Washington Post. Uh, we would like to welcome Dr. Pisano. Uh, thank you um, for being here. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. I'm so delighted to participate in this colloquium, and I'd like to um, say thank you to the Copper Road Center um, and support from the National Endowment for the Humanities for the invitation. So I'm going to talk today about research for my current book, which is about performances of democratic institutions in Russia and Ukraine. I'm going to be addressing my comments uh, today primarily to undergraduates and community members. Um, anyone who would like to know more can see my website, um, jessicabizano.net, for related publications and um, information. So the performances I'm going to discuss today take place in Ukraine and Russia, but also in other countries. One of emergence in the United States during the 2016 presidential campaign. So in the next 15 minutes, I'm going to show you what these performances are, explain where they come from, how they work, and conclude with some implications for democratic erosion. First, I'd like to show you a picture. This photo is from World War II. It depicts the Holland House Library in London during the Blitz. I really like the poster of it just next to my bookshelves. Now, why am I showing you this image? What does this photo have to do with democracy and authoritarianism in Russia and Ukraine? I'm showing it to you because it highlights an analytical problem that arises when we talk about democracy and authoritarianism. That problem has to do with interpretation, with the relationship between form and content, and with the meanings we assign to human actions. Now, we can agree that this photo depicts people looking at books sometime after a bombing, but that's about the extent of what we can be sure of. Most of us can't tell just by looking what these people are up to, or how they understand what it is they are doing. So let's look more closely. What does this photo suggest to you? The transcendent power of literature amidst destruction? Hope in the resilience of the human spirit that seeks art and beauty even in war? Or are these men seeking to steal and resell the most valuable volumes? Or is it a combination of the two? Now, we can ask the same question about the relationships between observation and meaning in certain political practices in 21st century Eastern Europe. I'm going to talk about two main ways people express their support of ideas or politicians, participation in elections and participation in street demonstra demonstrations. Now let's take a look at a street demonstration in Ukraine a number of years ago, when Viktor Yanukovych was president of Ukraine. It's a pretty typical example, both for Ukraine at that time and for Russian leaders. I'm using this example from the past rather than a contemporary example in order not to risk creating trouble for people who might be identified in a photo. Now, as is often the case, we can't tell just by looking why people are there and what meanings they attribute to their actions. In this photo, people are probably participating either because they needed money and agreed to participate in return for a day's pay, or because their bosses told them they had to show up or lose their jobs. In the case of students, if they're there, it would have been because their professors insisted they participate if they wanted a good grade. The tools of coercion here are not political, they're economic. 
the people choreographing the demonstration are appealing to participants' wallets. At the same time, the point is a show of support. So like elections whose outcomes are decided in advance, organizers are trying to create an impression of democratic participation. In Russia and Ukraine, as well as in other countries in the region, politicians staged both very large scale political theater, like national elections for incumbent politicians, or supposed grassroots demonstrations, and much smaller ones. So people might be compelled to repaint and refurbish a hospital or school, for example, to show a visiting leader that the lo local government is spending money properly. Now in Eastern Europe, such performances are common and well-known, but where did they come from? And if we look at Russia and Ukraine specifically, why do we find performances of democratic institutions in both those countries? After all, a lot of people would describe Russia as having an authoritarian government, while others see Ukraine as a struggling democracy. We can trace the origin of these phenomena to at least two sources. In its form, this kind of political theater resembles performances people used to put on for the ruling Communist Party in the second half of the 20th century, when both governed by the Soviet Union. But the content, the reasons people participate, have less to do with politics and more to do with risk in contemporary capitalism. To understand why this is the case, we have to look back to the beginning of the 1990s and the dissolution of the Soviet Union, the empire that had ruled Russia, Eastern Europe, and Central Asia for most of the 20th century. When the Soviet Union suddenly fell apart in the winter of 1991-1992, it was a real shock for most of the people who lived it. You might, in spring 2020, find that some of this sounds familiar. Almost overnight, competent federal authority disappeared. Supply chains for all kinds of things broke. Borders went up. Millions of people lost their jobs all at once. At the same time, prices for food started rising. While people faced widespread unemployment and privation, predatory entrepreneurs and politicians seized opportuni opportunities to appropriate the country's public assets. This economic crisis lasted for years. As time went on, cities, towns, and administrative regions faced steep budget shortfalls. They needed money from the center to balance their budgets. At the same time, because of the crisis, many local governments had to provide social services that previously had been the responsibility of companies. After nearly a decade of this, in 2000, in both countries came to power who used this situation to their advantage. National leaders told regional leaders that they wouldn't get anything from the national budget if they didn't make sure to deliver enough votes to keep the national leaders in office. Those regional leaders put pressure on cities and towns and large enterprises who put pressure on their inhabitants and workers to vote and demonstrate for the president. In some places, local leaders got people to vote by paying. But in many others, local leaders didn't have money to use to get people to vote for incumbent politicians. So local political and economic leaders threatened to take things away from people if they didn't participate in shows of support. They said they'd take away their salaries or their pensions. They told people the subway, the university, hospitals would be shut down if people didn't vote for the president. People believed them because after the crisis of the Soviet dissolution, it seemed like anything could happen. A lot of people cooperated because they couldn't afford not to. Other people though, could afford to ignore pressure to participate in shows of support for the president. And some people worked and lived in places where they weren't exposed to that pressure. Those people could continue practicing democratic politics. This meant that in the same time and place, some people saw themselves as participating in democratic elections, even if they were flawed, and other people saw themselves as participating in a farce. In a sense, both things were happening at the same time. There was political theater under pressure in which people imitated democracy and some form of democratic politics where people exercised choice. So what were the consequences of this situation? First, after the state seemed to disappear during the economic crisis of the 1990s, these theatrical performances brought the state back into people's lives. Now, nearly everyone was part of it. 
your little brother's school teacher, the doctor treating your mother's cancer, your college professor, the guy who was supposed to hook up the gas line in your grandmother's village. Directly or indirectly, those people became agents of the president. Second, it became hard to tell which were the kinds of practices we associate with democracy and which were imitations. Looking at large scale demonstrations, people sometimes couldn't agree about whether they had been captured by a politician or whether they were really grassroots initiatives. Third, this ambiguity was useful for incumbent politicians because as in the photo with which we began today, it was hard to tell the form of politics from its underlying meaning or content. Politicians succeeded in discrediting people who didn't agree with them. They would say that it was not their supporters, but the opposition that was being paid to participate in demonstrations, for example. We're starting to see practices like this emerge in the United States. The Mueller report, citing an indictment in the US District Court for the District of Columbia, found that in the final months of the 2016 presidential campaign, the Russia-based internet research agency organized pro-Trump rallies. They paid Americans to participate in demonstrations in multiple states, including Pennsylvania, Florida, and New York. Meanwhile, political scientist Alexander Haddad Fernandez has documented American companies' electoral pressure tactics in the 2000 and 2016 presidential campaigns in support of George W. Bush and Donald Trump. Hatzel Fernandez estimates that the proportion of American workers mobilized by their, their employers for political participation may reach as much as 30 to 40%. At the time of COVID-19 and all of its attendant economic challenges, it seems reasonable to expect that absent public vigilance, there is a risk that we could begin to see the rise of this kind of political theater and the gradual disappearance of practices we think of as democracy. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Pisano. That was um, very informative and also a chilling conclusion. Um, and I think now is a good time to start discussing both of the um, presentations. Uh, um, Dr. Anderson didn't explicitly connect what he was saying to the present moment, but I think that, um, you know, of course, questions arise, and I, I would like to explore those a little bit. Um, before I, uh, I guess, open up to Q&A, um, I maybe would like to ask uh, Dr. Anderson and Dr. Pisano if they have jotted down any questions they would like to um, ask each other or, you know, begin the conversation in that, in that manner. I have a question for, for Dr. Anderson. Hi. So I wondered if you, you could share with us your thoughts about where the distinction lies between hierarchy and responsibility and authoritarianism. Uh, could you clarify what you mean by responsibility? Well, so in thinking about, for example, a military chain of command, which is one of the illustrations you provided um, for thinking about authoritarian settings uh, that may exist within a democratic regime, um, there is both responsibility um, that uh, is, is uh, implicit in hierarchical structure, um, but there also may be opportunities for abuse because of that hierarchy. So my question to you is how analytically um, should we distinguish between situations in which um, operationally there may be ne necessary division of responsibilities and, and a hierarchy and um, something we think about as authoritarian politics. Exactly, it's a very, I think it's a very important distinction to, to make. Uh, the military, at least in the battlefield, needs orders to be followed uh, because there isn't time to have a debate. Similarly, a surgeon in the middle of an operation or has to say pass the pass this scissors instead of that one and you can't stop and debate if the heart is, you're having open heart surgery the problem is when those spheres start to migrate into areas where they're not needed and you didn't ask this but there's a related issue which is the hierarchy of education was eric Fromm has this wonderful thing i think it's an escape from freedom there's a difference between if it's operating properly, 
way education works, where, where the, uh, the teacher is in a hierarchical relationship with the student to some degree. Fromm is not Paulo Freire, so he doesn't do the whole democratic education. But what he does say is that a good teacher is going to give, good teachers are going to give everything they have to the students, and the students are going to equal or surpass the teacher. That's the goal of that relationship, which is very different uh, from what we're talking about in terms of authoritarian politics, with one exception, which is that authoritarian regimes of the types I talked about are very good at taking people from slightly below the 1% and promoting them. Uh, so they do within their hierarchical authoritarian structure give opportunity to lots of people. And this is part of the strength of societies like the Soviet Union in terms of resisting fascism. Uh, that they, they promote on the base of ability uh, to a, within a circumscribed, uh, in a circumscribed context. Uh, maybe following up on that, um, can you say a word or two about the relationship between bureaucracy and authoritarianism? Because it seems like, um, you know, modern societies, course, tend towards greater bureaucratization, which increases efficiency and so forth, but bureaucracy seems to share a lot of qualities with uh, authoritarian types of uh, command. Um, and how, you know, is there, a, is there a workaround for that, or is it inevitable? Well, again, within a, within a limited sphere, bureaucracy is probably a good thing, because we couldn't have these uh, large universities at low tuition without some kind of bureaucratic management. But of course, it seeps into all kinds of other, uh, other spheres and uh, there's a tendency for it to uh, become dominant. And in a certain sense, all three of the regimes I talked about were highly bureaucratic uh, regimes. Um, and uh, Dr. Pisano, you wanted to respond to, to that as well? Yeah, I think it's important that we make a distinction between um, bureaucracies as they might be conceived in places that have um, career civil servants and places in which bureaucr uh, bureaucracies have been politicized um, and aligned within hierarchies at the service, um, not of the public good, but of a particular leader. Um, because the latter, of course, um, is what produces uh, authoritarian rule, whereas a uh, functioning democracy does, in some sense, need uh, um, an apolitical um, bureaucracy in order to function. So bureaucracy is like a, a, a tool that can be used for good or evil. Well, it can be used to serve public ends or it can be used to uh, serve the interests of particular um, political leaders. Um, and the distinction between those two things in uh, arguably in the United States has, um, has become uh, confused, um, especially with uh, the way in which the executive branch has chosen to talk about um, uh, public institutions within the federal government, um, you know, whether we're talking about the FBI or the CDC or other, um, other areas of responsibility. Um, Kevin? Uh, yeah, just add one quick thing. You know, as is well known, the great sociologist Max Weber ends one of his books with this metaphor of the iron cage or iron cylinder that we've created. And this is what uh, capitalist modernity really is, this iron cage uh, that we've created for ourselves. And so even the normal apolitical operation of bureaucracy also has some problems in terms of swallowing up um, the, 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 what we could call the democratic sphere, even when it's not overtly being uh, politicized. And a question for uh, uh, Jessica Pisano, very interesting presentation. Uh, in, in this former Soviet Union and, and in Ukraine, this 10 years or so, when there was, quote, democracy, unquote, when there were multi party when there were multiple parties and a lot more debate independent press this was also the period of the precipitous economic most precipitous economic decline uh, i was in russia in 98 and saw that and uh, so a lot so democracy i mean as similarly in weimar germany you could say at the end of 14 years well you've had 14 years of democracy are you better off now 
than you were before. And uh, a lot of people would have said they were better off before. So I wonder if you could address that. I mean, that's a common, maybe that's a cliche type interpretation. Well, I think there are two um, things that we need to keep in mind when we think about that interpretation. Um, one of those is that um, the fact that there were um, more democratic uh, elections in the sense that there were more parties involved in Russia, in the sense that there was some kind of oligarchic competition between various media sources um, and, um, and a state that was not, did not possess the capacity um, to compel people to um, participate in shows of support at that time um, is not necessarily uh, related causally to the economic policies that were being put in place at that time which is to say that the economic crisis um, that was precipitated in the, in the 1990s at the beginning of the decade in part was due to the um, dissolution of the Soviet Union and what that meant for the dismantling of the command uh, economy structure in which all decisions previously had been made in Moscow um, and uh, supply chains were scattered across uh, in a geographical expanse that became um, divided into uh, constituent republics that became states. Um, that, that, um, that situation was partially due to the dissolution and everything that accompanied to it, it accompanied it, but it was also due to policy choices in the 1990s that included um, the privatization of, uh, of public goods, um, the privatization of land, of enterprises, of things that people had built uh, during social ended up in the hands of very people. Um, at the end of that process, and that it was precisely the processes of enclosure. Um, people no longer had access to the things that they had used to make their life economically um, that were vulnerable to the economic pressure that then came along um, in the, the 2000s um, as the state learned to, um, to use that uh, to get people to support particular political candidates. So that's number one. Number two is that I think it's important to understand the relationship at the local level um, between these economics um, and political behavior because um, as we know, um, there is often uh, an association between lower middle class support um, for politicians and certain types of authoritarianism or fascism. But what we see in the cases of Ukraine and Russia is that that support is not necessarily ideological. It's a support that um, is present because of concrete economic incentives that if, if removed could lead people to vote in very different ways. So this is something in mind, I think also um, in our contemporary moment, which is to say that we have to be careful about attributing um, to people who may support politi particular political leaders, um, the ideas held by those political leaders. People may be voting for very different uh, pocketbook reasons. Um, and if ways can be found to um, change those reasons, then it may be that uh, um, political leaders who are um, compelling people to support them um, may find that their basis of support is significantly less than we thought. I, I, you both um, either implicitly or explicitly mentioned the role of crisis in um, kind of uh, providing an opening for, you know, creeping authoritarianism to blossom. And that, you know, that sort of begs the question about this current moment where we are, you know, suffering the crisis of pandemic plus uh, the economic fallout, which is likely to be quite long lasting. Um, do we already see signs of uh, authoritarian creep? Um, and what are they? And what should we be looking for? And is there just, this is a kind of a practical question, but is there anything we can do about it? I think one of the early signs we're seeing, I think much remains, remains to be seen, right? Because we're at the very beginning of, of a long, um, of a long condition associated with the, this pandemic. But, it's possible that um, one of the things that we are seeing right now um, is, um, you know, among governors who are making decisions to reopen their economies um, long before 
um, public health officials and scientists, epidemiolog epidemiologists, uh, and medical professionals um, would recommend that this be done, um, you know, it's possible that those, those individuals are responding to political signals um, from Washington. Um, uh, and that this, these risks that are being taken, um, certainly when compared with the public opinion data, which suggests uh, support for social distancing um, rather than reopening in many cases, um, is, is part of the beginning of the unfolding of these types of economic incentives, right? Governors know that they are going to need um, federal help or federal relief from contributions to the federal budget uh, in order to survive. Um, and so the signals we're getting from governors, you know, may be a beginning of that process. That's frightening and similar to what you described um, as the mechanisms for, you know, pressure on theater uh, in in Russia. So um, thank you. Uh, Dr. Anderson, did you have any? Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I think we have to view, view it dialectically in the sense of, you take the concept of twilight. Max Horkheimer, the great critical theorist of fascism and other things, wrote of, a book called Demeron or Dawn, but the German word actually means twilight. And when you're in twilight, you don't know if it's the twilight before the dawn or the twilight uh, that's going into uh, the, the dead of night. And so we, we're at a transition point. Mm. Clearly, uh, there's lots and lots of authoritarian tendencies and possibilities out there, but there's lots and lots of grassroots initiatives going on, mobilizations, rethinking, for one thing, is this just a pandemic or is the pandemic the uh, precipitate cause of a larger economic crisis that was ready to, to drop anyway? You know, the stock market at 29, the Dow Jones at 29,000, is that actually real? Or we're in another, I think we clearly were in another uh, bubble. And also the attitudes of the general public toward the working classes, these so-called essential workers, and particularly toward the medical workers, uh, these are these are new these are examples of heroism that are not militaristic, that are not authoritarian, and we almost are getting a different model uh, of what that is. And even the military is shifting with this uh, captain who's now a hero for protecting his uh, his, his his sailors as opposed to. Uh, doing the gung-ho, aggressive kind of thing. And so if even inside the military, someone like that is cheered. I think there's a lot of uh, seeds out there of positive possibilities, humanistic, anti-authoritarian, democratic. And of course, the Sanders campaign in the United States was also, especially out here in California, the gigantic Latinx community. And um, Latinx community was overwhelmingly for Sanders, especially the youth, and there wasn't a single Latinx politician at the state level that backed Sanders, a major one that backed Sanders. So we have all these kinds of interesting cleavages going on that could lead in positive, progressive directions. But of course, that's not a, there's no guarantee of that. And organization and ideas are, of course, very important. It doesn't just, and intellectuals uh, like us, uh, need to uh, participate in that, in that, in those debates and those uh, solidarities. Let me just add to that also, um, you know, an uptick in uh, unionization activities and workers' resistance, um, which we'll see how that plays out with with unemployment. But um, it's uh, something else to look at. Um, I think uh, Laura also had a question, Dr. Kahn. Yeah, I just have one question for um, both of you. Thank you so much for your comments. And just to kind of bring it back to um, uh, Dr. Anderson, you talked about, you know, people championing the hospital workers. Um, I'm curious, though, about the tension with protesters, for example, blocking hospitals. And I'm thinking also about um, the politics of masking and how that has now kind of become something where some people choose to mask for public health reasons and for personal health reasons, but there are many people who don't and decide that that's something that encroaches upon their rights when in some respect we're all talking about the air that we breathe. And I was curious if you could speak to the performance-based aspects of that 
but also whether or not um, there's some sort of creeping authoritarianism by having a government or local health departments asking people and, and, and insisting people mask. Yeah, I think this kind of thing is, a, is always a danger, of course. Uh, however, I, I think the community spirit of the masking and the social distancing, well, really it's physical distancing. I don't like the phrase social distancing. But the problem is when you walk on the streets with a mask, you're not only physically distant, but there's no easy way to like have a smile or the neck. We, we have to, we'll, we'll figure this out in terms of hand gestures and so on, but we're not there yet. Um, and it's very difficult for protest movements to, to mobilize. I mean, there've been a few cases of people driving around in their cars, a few public demonstrations, but it's very, very difficult. So in that sense, it's a little bit like the first, I mean, not to that extent, but in the first months of Nazi Germany, people were just so shocked that the public space they thought they had, the political, just like disappeared, like really suddenly. The trade union party offices were like shut down and people just did not know what to do. They were, and it, it uh, and so we're in one of those shock moments right now, shock and awe, as uh, Naomi Klein calls it, uh, but hopefully it won't turn out in the way that some of the uh, worst case scenarios uh, you, you find in, in, in her writings. Oh, and just sorry, because even Franklin Roosevelt, who's probably the most progressive president we've had in the past over 100 years, it was under Roosevelt that the FBI really became the institution that it is today. A, 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 it was a minor institution until Roosevelt's administration. So. All these kinds of uh, progressive movements, when they're organized by the state, um, come with, with, with difficulties as well. Yeah, so, I mean, I think that there are a number of things to say here. And one of the things we need to be thinking about is uh, the tyranny of the state. Um, but not only, we also need to be thinking about the tyranny of um, you know, a neighbor or other individuals who may um, decide that their choice um, uh, not to mask, for example, uh, puts others in danger, others in danger. Um, so I think, you know, the, the principles that we need to think about are about, you know, separating scientific authority from state authority so that the leadership uh, regarding public health initiatives is coming from scientists. Um, and that uh, people, uh, social movements are going to need to think about how to assemble in these contexts, but accepting the fact that there are going to be public health based constraints. You know, I would add that when we think about political theater, um, the need for physical distancing in a pandemic um, is going to be a limitation not only for uh, social movements, but also for uh, states who may wish to uh, assemble people to pretend support, right? So that in some senses, we're all acting under the same constraints, but there needs to be a science-based um, acceptation of the constraints that will protect each other's lives and protect our uh, healthcare systems. Thank you. Um, I think we unfortunately have run out of time. Um, and, uh, but I think we could go on for a long time and I wish we had time to do that. Um, but I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Pisano and Dr. Anderson for joining us today and presenting this fascinating material that we could continue to, um, to debate and, and discuss. And hopefully, and I don't know if either of you would be interested in questions coming in later from students who view, um, who view the, the presentations, uh, that, that could be an option. Um, but we thank you very much for joining us today and um, providing this important resource that I'm really sure that faculty, students, and hopefully people outside of the QCC community will continue to utilize um, in the near and more distant future in their, in their work. Thank you. And thank you on behalf of the Kufferberg Holocaust Center. We really appreciate it. For those that are watching, please be sure to check out our website at khc.qcc.cuny.edu for more information on our programming, exhibitions, and educational materials. Be well. <laughs>